I was wondering what you do when the sun is shining, and then I remember I'm in Gothenburg, so I forget about it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. You know what? You need to be funny all the time when you're in Gothenburg. There's a lot of pressure on me here now. <laughs> I'm from the Internet Stifterson, and I'm working as the Chief Information Security Officer. I've been there like in 4,019 years. I used to say since the Pope was young, but that's not true. That's not true any longer. <laughs> Um, I am. Um, I was studying at the University of Stockholm in 1984. I had my exam. There were no PCs back then. I can tell you. Oh, I, it was one in in the basement. Very very strange. So we didn't really touch that. Uh, more, nothing about that. Uh, briefly about the foundation. We are an independent organization that has the benefit of the works for the benefit of the public and promote the positive development of internet in Sweden and elsewhere. And uh, the thing is, we are managing the technical operation of .sc and .nu, top level domains. That is what, is what we make money from. And we spend the money on the other side, which is like uh, promotion of internet and the use of internet. We also have identity federations for the healthcare, Sambi, and the state schools, school uh, And we, as I said, what we gain from the carousel, we put into the Holocaust, or something like that. Rollercoast. <laughs> something was wrong. I didn't hear that. Sorry, Holocaust, Rollercoast, whatever. A lot of fun, as you can understand. Yeah. So this is an old saying from a very old request for comment document from the IETF. It's we live on trust. Uh, because that is what we do. We, we live on trust. We don't have a contract with the Swedish government. We don't have a contract even with ICANN. We have the right uh, to run the Swedish top level domain. And we have the delegation. And as long as we do a good job, uh, we can keep on doing that. But it's not a guarantee that we will be there forever if we don't manage well. Anyone here knows who DNS, how DNS works? <laughs> One or two? Good. Well, it tells you about where to go when you type in a web address or a mail address and you get the answer. Where should I go? Uh, back to the resolver. If not, you not, don't have the answer, then you need to contact the server find the IP address, and so send it back. There's a small movie, a video that the sensor organization recorded some years ago that explains that. Not in details, I can tell. Um, this is, anyone heard about Cricket EU? Cricket is like um, Mr. DNS in, in a lot of senses, but he explains it that the distributed network of service that reconciles the domain names and URLs and email address to numerical IP addresses, which is behind every successful internet transaction. And if you ask people today, if they know what's behind the fact that they toss in a web address or an email address, they have no clue. They can't even tell the difference between the web and the internet, so why should they know about the ask? Uh, what he also says is, due to long-standing vulnerability, it's also behind some of the most dangerous hacks. And this, it, it, this didn't used to be a problem, um, but, but then we had to fix it some years ago. And there's a fix, and it's called DNSSEC, Domain Name System Security Extension. It has been available for years, and I will tell you a little bit more about it, um, how it started and where we stand now and why you should do it. So this is the explanation, the short one. Se security extension to the domain name system, DNS. It protects you from tampered or fake DNS data, uh, such as in DNS cache poisoning, farming, and man middle attacks. Also used to securely distribute attributes from other security protocols and solutions. So that is what Per will tell you more about. I will just mention it briefly. It does work with cryptographic signatures to make sure that the DNS <coughs> response comes from a correct source uh, and that data hasn't been man manipulated. The headers, the number of the RFCs explaining it in details, so you can actually go there and read it. We have the person here who was part of writing that RFC, Jakob. Uh, so if you really want to talk about DNS, the technical, deep technical part of it, that's the man. 
2005, I can, I can tell you, I started my first, not my first, but the first DNSSEC project I participated in was in 1999. Then we started, I was then working for the Swedish ICT Commission for the government, and I was really, I have always, since the first view of it, I have been in love with DNS. I fell in love instantly, because I think it's such a great idea. It's absolutely amazing to, to think about how it has grown without anyone changing the basic protocols, who it was, how it was from the beginning. But 1999, people started to, to be a little bit worried about the vulnerability that Steve Bellowin found in early 90s, which meant that it was very easy to change the information in the DNS and tamper the response that you get, got from the name server. Now they managed to keep that information back for a couple of years, but I think it was released 1994, and, and then they started to work on it to find a solution, and 1999 was the first time they had something, but it didn't work. I don't know whether you were a part of that workshop, you were, yeah, then you know, nothing worked. It was like, okay, go back to ITF, keep on working. So next time we had anything that was possible to test, I think that was 2003 when we had the second workshop and then the protocol was almost ready. There was a lot of problem with key management, which is always is when you are talking about cryptography. Uh, but 2005, before that, we started in, in .sc, I think that was in 2003 as well, we started a parallel universe. We had our own internet uh, and we started to sign with the protocol that was in draft by then. And I told the technical team that six months after the standard is ready and, and uh, accepted by the IETF, we will go with, forward with the NSIC and sign of SE. So we did that in 2005, and we were first, the first top level way in the world to, to sign it, uh, to sign it at the top level with the NSIC. And others was actually starting to think about the NSEC and started to think about implementing it, but it didn't really move forward very quickly. So I think it was more or less two or three years later before someone else got onto it. I think that was with the Czech that first after us. Anyway, 2008, this poor guy, Dan Kaminsky, oh, terrible picture, sorry, Dan. <coughs> he discovered a bug uh, that meant that you could attack DNS and the time to perform that kind of attack went from a couple of days because it's not very easy to attack the DNS. It, it wasn't back then that at least. So the, the time shrank from a couple of days to minutes, which actually changed the picture of the, of the seriousness of this vulnerability. And I think then the whole world was shivering a bit because then my, and, and all of us realized we need to do some, something really now fast about the Kaminsky bug. I think they, again, managed to fix it with rubber band, glue, tape, gaffa, something like that to get around in another couple of years. But then I think it was uh, really Something that you need to do, still DNSSEC, what does it handle then? Authentication of origin, uh, verifying data integrity to make sure that no one has been tampering with the information on the way, authenticated response to queries and of non-existing domains. That was one of the trickiest part to actually get an answer for something that you asked for but mm. don't exist. I remember that was a really tricky part. Uh, and for DNS data and that only, nothing else. DNS can't handle confidentiality as such. There was no plan to do that. Verification of the identity of the person behind the domain name, no. And it won't stop criminals from using the internet. And it won't stop world starvation. There was a lot of hope back then, you know. People could do wonders with this. And I very, very often back then got the question, how secure is DNS? Or DNS, it should say DNSSEC actually, because it's as secure as you make it. If you use a lousy algorithm, then you will have a lousy solution and not very secure. But if you have 
a good use of algorithm, a good, a good implementation, and proper operations, processes, routines, and procedures, then you're safe. But how should you do it then? Well, <coughs> the how is more about how did we go ahead to make sure that the entire internet was protected with DNSSEC. We started to write letters from, from uh, Internet Stiftelsen, from Netno, from other parties uh, who started to nag ICANN, those who are responsible for the root zone, and tell them, hey, you really, really need to sign the root zone because with all the top level domains starting to get signed one by one, there was a lot of keys to keep track of for those poor resolver parties uh, because they have to install the key in the resolvers. And if you have so many different keys, and not only that, people are rolling keys from time to time, then you have a huge problem and it easily gets wrong. But finally, we managed to convince ICANN and ICANN started a project uh, to design how to sign the root soon, all the procedures and everything I was talking about. And who did they ask? They went to Jakob and his friend Frederick. And they went to ICANN and said, hey guys, you need to do this the proper way. So it's actually two suites behind the entire sign that I'm going to tell you about. Now. But eventually, uh, in 2010, in June, the internet <coughs> wrote some of our sign. Uh, <clears throat> and there was a lot of means to try to protect the DNS circuit trust anchors, the keys. So the uh, whole idea was, hmm, ICANN is, or rather was, an American-based organization. It was controlled by the Department of Commerce, and the, the, I think it was also in the hands of the uh, NTIA, the Swedish, well not the Swedish, the American counterpart to the Swedish Post and Telecom Agency. And to be able to convince the Russians, the, the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Europeans that this is something that you can trust, they had to build a model, a trust model, where there was a lot of people involved. And one of, one of the categories of people that are involved is trusted community representatives. So they made, made a call, and they asked for people who was interested to participate in the key generation for DNSSEC in the root zone. Um, and I applied. And this is sort of part of the TCR selection criteria and selection process. Strong technical knowledge of the internet was not the determining factor, but you have to be rather more like sane <laughs> and a lot of other things. So there was a lot of criteria. Uh, and I got the job. <coughs> There are two different data centers in the U.S. that where these key ceremonies are taking place. There's one in El Segundo, Los Angeles, on the West Coast. Now, Frederick and Jacob, they talked to me and said, you need to apply, and as I told you, I did. But they were friendly enough, they thought, uh, because they were part of the selection too. There was a lot of people who applied for this um, TCR roles. And, uh, they suggested that I would go and be on the East Coast. Can you see the difference? Sunny, Pogs, Los Angeles, California, Culpeper, Virginia. Okay, it's a two hour shorter ride, but still, I don't know. No, I like Culpeper. It's a beautiful city, town, small. It's Trump land. Keep your, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Physical security is actually something it's built upon. We trust that a lot, and uh, because um, there is nothing that is online in this design, so this is more or less a s description of the different tiers or layers that is protection protecting this um, ceremony room and uh, safes. I will show you more detailed pictures. There's a detail. <laughs> this is the wall. It's uh, strengthened with the uh, metal. And this is the vestibule, a lot of signs that of, about things that you're not allowed to. Um, <coughs> no weapons, for instance. But that's a lie. The first time we had the ceremony, there was an armed guy standing there. And he looked very much like James Eastwood. 
very serious. Um, there were some specific reasons for that because everything, all the equipment needed to be out of the safe for such a long time and people need to go to, to buy a break sometimes and then he was there watching the equipment so you know, every time they were there. Anyway, physical controls. There are a lot of two hands in this, two individuals jointly for each operation. <coughs> the two people opening the doors, two, pe op two people opening boxes, and there's separation of duties. I go back to that, external monitoring camera, sensors. Sensors is interesting. And remember there was some, some time on the West Coast when s some of the safe operators slammed the door, it would be too hard. So the sensor of earthquake went off, which means that everything locks. Uh, and it took them some time to you know, calculate how to get out there without uh, getting off the alarm, but they had to in the end. <laughs> the only way to get out. So there's a lot of interesting details in this case. The safes. The safes, there are two of them. One of, of one of them are kept keeping all the equipment, the HSM and the computer that's used. The other one is full of boxes and put back there too. They are bolted to the ground. I don't know if you can see that. They're really, really heavy. It's not that you just take under your arm and walk away with it. Uh, and you can see there's a metal bar that's locking it to the, to the floor as we go. And when we go in there, it gets really, really crowded. There's a lot of people involved, um, and we need to be in there all at the same time. We are following a very, very detailed script, as you can see. It's really, really into details. <laughs> um, so, insert USB port expander into laptop. Check. Uh, time. <laughs> it took some. It takes some time to go through this. It's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of control. So you need to be patient. Um, and here you can see the safe is open, and every this safe is having all the boxes. There's two lock on each box. This is mine, and the ceremony master had one key. I had the other key, and we turn it at the same time, and then we open the box. And in there, there are plastic bags, tamper evident proof bags that keep smart cards which is used to activate the HSF. So that is what it looks like. I have always been curious about the screwdriver over there, but I, I don't know, I have to ask. If it's still there, I have to ask. And everything is kept, as I said, in tamper proof evidence bags. So you have to, I, I can make sure that nobody, nobody have been into my box in the safe and tampered with the smart card. But then again, there are always some, you know, we have this very, very, uh, some of the people taking part of this process is thinking too much. So there was some time that somebody told us that, hey, wait a minute, if you have this plastic bag and the smart cards in that, you could, with a little thin needle, stick that through the plastic and try to read out the electric signal from the chip and then you could have you know the key in some way or another um, so we decided to add plastic boxes so now we have plastic bags with plastic boxes and smart cards i don't know what the next step would be but we'll see we will come up with something so every time i get that out of carefully checking all the seals so it will be um, intact. The int it's really an interesting issue actually. We changed the tamper evident proof bags once because there was an Israeli girl who managed to open one of the bags of the brand that we used without disability. We couldn't tell. So she found out something, some way to do it. So we had to change the vendor. That is really interesting. You never know. Uh, it's recorded and streamed. You can all, all, all of you can follow it from distance. Everything is marked, you know, with signs and red stripe tapes, uh, handled with great care. So this is the HSM, it's not very exciting. Uh, no tampering. <coughs> that is one of the ideas. How do we know that nobody have tampered with this cable and the contact? Well, we strip it. So then we can see, there's nothing there. That shouldn't be. And here's the smart cards that are used to activate the HSM. Everything is rolled, this toe of everything. We have this principle in Noah's Ark. 
keep two of everything, it would be good. So there, we're also rolling the different cards so we know that the, everything works. Since it's just every six months, you know, people can think can stop working for that period, during that period, and then we have to get another one. Nothing to hide. I'm, I remember after the first or second ceremony, I started to complain about people didn't dress correct, properly. It was this you know, usual t-shirt, short sandals, ponytails, and it was recorded, it was streamed, and the, the whole idea was that people should trust the ceremony and say, you need to be a little bit, you know, more. So they accepted that, and uh, Mehmet, who this is, he was from, from the beginning one of the ceremony masters, he started to, to wear a suit and tie, and then some of the thin foil hats <laughs> said, how do we know that you haven't hidden anything in, in the sleeves? So then he had to take off his costume again and you know fold up the arms and yeah, nothing to hide. Very important. So the two type of key ceremonies, the key generation, where you generate new keys, case, and then we're managing the soon signing keys uh, from a key signing request. And yeah, that's signing soon signing keys for the next quarter is actually what's taking place uh, four times a year. Um, generating new case case have only happened twice. One, 2010, and the second time last year. Well, here's very sign. They have this key signing request that they bring to make sure that they got the right zone signing keys back. And uh, this guy, even though we met him several times, he always used, had to show his passport and identify himself. And so we're following the script very, very carefully. Ceremony master, this is ICANN, they have a different role. Ceremony master, internal witnesses, system administrators, safe security controllers, whose any, only job is to open the safe and close the safe. Uh, and there are other roles managing the KSK crypto officer, where I am one of them. And then we have this KSK recovery key shareholders, I get back to that. The crypto officer have physical keys to safety fit boxes that you saw in the picture. Uh, and they hold <coughs> what, what's needed to activate the HSM. And I can cannot generate a new KSK or sign some signing keys without presence of three out of seven crypto officers. So always need to be three of us there. <coughs> and we must have the ability to travel to the U.S. twice a year. The key recovery sh shareholders, they are plan B. If nobody should be able to travel to the U.S. to attend to any of these key ceremonies from either the East Coast or the West Coast, uh, then we have a, a key that is used to, en to encrypt the key signing key, uh, <coughs> and that is stored uh, in, that is stored in the hardware security model, the HSM. Uh, so, they, if there's need, if if there is a need to get a bootstrap somewhere else than any other sites that exist already, then we have to call for the RKSH holders uh, because they are. I can have the encryption key on a smart card. These people have this fragmented key that is able to encrypt uh, or decrypt, rather, the KSK. This was really complicated. It is complicated. The, the point is, this is plan B, if something goes bad. But they, have, they must have the ability to travel with short notice, and they don't know when. Hopefully never, uh, but to be able to make sure that they have still this smart card and in their position, uh, possession, they, ICANN is making an uh, annual inventory, so they had to send a selfie with today's newspaper and the smart card uh, to show ICANN that they still have this smart card. I don't know whether they still do that, but that is procedure. And sometimes someone needs to be replaced, so if the crypto officer steps down or wants to step down, then we have a special procedure for that, and that would take another two, one or two hours. Um, usually these key ceremony takes about three hours. So now I don't have the key to the internet because yeah, I, I'm sure you have seen Swedish for instance, articles about she has the key to the internet. No, 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 no. This is the key to my box, nothing else. 
and DNS actually is standard procedure, nothing else. And you can't participate from home, but you need tons of pop coffee because it's not that funny. <laughs> but I could recommend you to at least have a look once uh, because it is kind of interesting uh, to, to follow because of all the details. I think that is the most interesting part. We have, or they have, or all of us together have been thinking about everything, how to do this properly in order to build trust, because that is the basic idea. We need to build trust. So how many signed domains do we have today in .sc? Well, you can see 45% is not that good. Um, unfortunately, even though we have been trying to convince our registrars to sign their customers' domains, uh, and some of them have been doing that, it's not enough. We actually give them some money to do it. But some of them not really listen too much. And it's not that it's a huge customer requirement uh, for DNS, because people don't know. They don't even know about DNS. So how in the world should they know about DNS? Recent activities, rolling the KSK, as I said, that's what happened last year because it was time to change the trust anchor. Um, and the reason for that was not that it was a risk that it had been um, tampered with or anyone who had you know, got on hands on the on it, but it was a need to be sure that we were able to do this operation when everything is working fine and every, everything is happy and shiny, you know, no hurry, no stress, no crisis going on, just to make sure that we have all the parts of the operations needed to actually roll the key and, and to take uh, proper notes about what can go wrong and how do it, does it affect to do this because it's a very, very heavy operation and, and you can't <coughs> do anything about, you can't check, you can't test, you can't test every single environment or every single software or combination of those. There's a lot of people that will be affected that you have no idea because there's so many resolver operators out there that you have no relation to. So it's actually very, very complicated. Okay, it was a long time of planning. It was postponed for a year uh, because they were very unsecure about how many would be affected and what the result could be. And finally, in October last year, there was this key rollover. And some people say that it's not finished yet because we haven't really, I think the re it's not removed the old KSK yet. It is now. Yeah, so then it is ready. And there's, as I said, a lot of people were involved, and not a lot of people needed to do things. Network operations who were validating signatures, they had to update the system with a new KSK because that is trust anchor and you have to put it into your name servers in order to continue validation. And you can actually, you, by then you could test a lot. Of, there was a lot of testing um, around and you could test if it worked and what current trust anchor you did have in your, in your resolver. Uh, because without the current DNS, KSK DNS validation would not be performed and DNS resolvers would not reply to any DNS queries. And that would happen then. If you didn't, they were out of, out of the internet. So, did you see what happened there? If you do, didn't have the trust anchor in your resolver, boom, okay? Now, DNS hijacking is uh, something that has been discussed for some time and it has become a reality uh, this year. I don't know how many of you have read a FireEye report about DNS hijacking. It is, I should say, I'm, I'm not sure that it would call it hijacking exactly, but still, this is something that can happen to everyone and you need to have control over your domain name system to make sure that you know what you have and nothing else get in there. So I think I recommend you all to read that uh, recommendations from, uh, from the Department of Homeland Security. They sent out a lot of information about what to, what to do and what not to do. So you have to give your DNS some love if you don't do that today. Update passwords, implement multi-factor authentication, and audit public DNS records 
search for encryption certificates that are um, uh, that are um, what do you say utgivna that's not yours issued issued thank you and whitelist the CAs the certificate authorities that you allow to do certificates for you and make sure that you monitor properly everything so this is the current statistics globally uh, there's 1,532 TLDs in the road zone. Most of them are signed because that's the requirement that I can put up when they allow for new DTLDs. And here's some useful tools to use actually for implementation. We have Zone Master, that is a joint development project between us, Internet Stiftelsen, and AFNIC, our French counterparts. So master, uh, there is DNS analyzer from Verisign Labs, and uh, there is DNS Wiz, uh, where you can see uh, the trust chain and follow that. Some of them really good, and you can check if your domain is signed. And if it's not, then you have this ugly face <laughs> fronting you. Um, and if it's signed, I would be very happy. So you can try that at home. And here's some other useful tools, internet.nl, uh, hard nice, so most are mentioned in DNS with. Validation rate by country, because it's not only about signing, even though I sign my domain, if nothing ha happens in the other end, if nobody validates the, the signature, there's no good. It has, it's no meaning to have the signatures if you don't check it in the other end. So, but we are very good doing that in Sweden, which is interesting. I've been for a long time. It's not that hard because it's a small country. We know most of the ISPs. We can talk to them. We can tell them and convince them this is a good thing. We were lucky that people were brave in 2005. They didn't really, they weren't so much aware about what could go wrong, which was good for us. So they, they dared to try actually. Telia was the first one who turn on the validation. So, and that's easy. I mean, there's no brain in DNS and it's nothing protected. You need to do it yourself. This is an interesting uh, development as well where Jakob is involved too. Maybe you can say a couple of words of Cryptic and its status right now. It's another HSM. It's built by an open source. So anyone could um, implement. Yes, please. If you want me, no. 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 Uh, so this is an um, open source, open hardware um, HSM that's uh, been developed. It's uh, most of the hardcore work has been done on uh, Joachim Sternberg's on that uh, short. Uh, I'm just one of the uh, initiators of this project. But um, so we develop um, open source hardware uh, with FPGAs for protection of the keys. Um, it's not really done. It's not. Uh, it's not. It's it's useful for testing and playing around. But uh, mm -hmm. and if you want to build your own HSM, you can use it as a starting point. Um, but there is hardware that exists in reality, and you can uh, buy some test stuff. Yep, it's That's from Diamond. What's the name of the company? Diamond Key Security. Is Diamond one, uh, Key. They produced the first commercial ones. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I know. I only have the the lab one. Yeah. So do I. Not me. But our team. They are really We're slow. Testing. Yeah. They're slow, yeah. Yes, extremely slow. So, that's it. <laughs> Questions? Yeah.